manufacturing and stuff. So I just pulled these two off right here. So they could all, I cut out part of the very end. But somehow the big thing with probiotics and yogurts and all uh, those fermented drinks and everything. And they talked to, and at the very end, they looked at age, sex, um, and a couple other determinants. They found the only really differences, significant differences were between that. Now, what can that be due to? Genetics or food or what? Kind of interesting in that. And here, though, most of the viruses, most of the organisms that cause cancer are what? Viruses, right? We just covered this one. It's actually going to be on this test. Oh, in fact, what does mycoplasm cause? Walking pneumonia is like a typical pneumonia. There you go. Look at that now. Bacteria. So now we got bacteria thrown in the mix, which is helping to give us cancer. Yeah, the guy with the funky face were past that. Jardia. Jardia, yeah. And I've actually got an issue with this on Jardia. Anybody wants to work? This is the one that um, kids get at Walmart, right? They were talking about? Or no? They get at what? Walmart. Like yeah. from the baskets? Like now they do the. Oh, uh, that. I wouldn't doubt it being Jardia. I think that probably be cola would be my guess. Because oh. those, those little things you sit in, the kid, little kids sit in, you flop down and you put the little kid in there. Yeah. What's sitting on that little thing you flop down? Their poop, their butt. A little dirty diaper butt on there, right? So that's probably what you call that. Okay, Jardia. Jardia uh, intestinalis is the main one. And it gets diagnosed based on what? Cyst identification in the stool or the presence of Jardial DNA. Giardia is also pretty symptomatic, a particular type of diarrhea you get. Usually kind of gassy and uh, sometimes a little bit oily sometimes. Okay. Remember, remember, I can work on the treatments. We don't have to talk about that. Permit infection. Permit infection in different areas by use of filtered water. Have you ever, anybody camp or go camping or anything? Or no messes before in this like career? Have you seen those little straws you they use that you can buy? Yeah. yeah. Filter yeah, yeah, straws. Yeah. yeah. One of the things they'll do to help filter out are these cysts. Mm. Those weights. Huh? Those weights. Yeah, mm -hmm. they actually work pretty well. There's something they don't have the medical yeah, yeah, yeah. Hold on a second, won't you? What happened to this? Do you all do you all have some more slides on the idea than I do? No, there's only two. Yeah, I only have two and one picture. Yeah. All right. You skip them. They're more packed, I think. Are they bad for? Yeah. No. Well, yes. Yeah, oh, there it is. Right there. That's what I'm looking for. <laughs> okay, thank you guys. I'm like, glad I know there's more. Okay. So, this causes the gastrointestinal disease in the U.S., and it's due to ingestion of cysts in the water. And it ranges from asymptomatic infection to gastrointestinal disease. Again, diarrhea, pain. Bloating, nausea, vomiting, and fever. It's just pretty uncomfortable. The interesting thing about it is, and you can't see this, is the mechanism by which Giardia causes this. Giardia, you, you ingest the cysts, they excess, they move it up from the colon to the lower, uh, small intestine, where they actually attach with this sucker disc to the intestinal oh. wall. And they just hold on there. And then they just feed off the nutrients that come down through there. But you can get so many of them on there, they start blocking what? What does your small intestine do? Absorb Absorption, nutrients. right? Yeah. So that's one of the main sides of absorption. So they actually start mechanically blocking the absorption of nutrients in food. And then they can also do this right here, which can cause um, damage from the adhesion disc. Do those heal or? Yeah, because remember, what, what are you damaging? The lining. The mucosal lining, so that, that recovers pretty quickly, right? Oh, okay. Now, this is kind of an interesting disease. I have an issue with this map right here. I'm going to look it up in the CDC. So this has what, US 19, 2014. 
It has none reported. I guess it says none reported, no reported cases in 2014. That must mean people in there. Last time I checked, and I can't see it changing, there is no water in the U.S. that is not infected with GRDM. What? Period. Nothing. The only place I know where you can go and you can find water you can really drink right out of the, the water with a cup is way up in the Arctic Circle in Canada where the fresh water is because that water stays so cold. That means even if you're on a glacier or you're on a mountain and there's a glacier above you up in Colorado and you see this nice little stream flowing down like we talked about before, just because it looks nice and clean that doesn't mean there's not a moose or a squirrel or deer or something that's pooping upstream from you. So there's no place you can safely drink it. Does that mean every time you take a drink you're going to get jarty? Did I tell you about my friend who got jarty with his wife and his two kids? <laughs> Tell us. So they were up in Santa Fe, and the two little kids, the two little kids were playing in a little stream, a runoff stream, and they were splashing around. And so a few days later, his wife was putting them in a little tub. There were small little kids to give them a bath, and guess what happened? Oh gosh, how old are they? All of a sudden, <clears throat> and then what are little kids gonna do in a tub when they just poop in it? They gonna sit there and go, whoa, oh, 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 be careful? No, they're gonna what? Jump out. They're going to splash around and go, oh, gross, nasty, 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 and some of the water splashes into her mouth. Oh. And she came down with Charlie later on. That's my favorite. I love that. Oh, <laughs> God, that was terrible. All right. All right, so that's not this. Chukamona Santinella. Well, I can tell you your <laughs> You got a story about this thing? Oh, yeah. Oh, God. <laughs> I don't want to tell you guys. Chukamona the most common protozoan causing heat in industrialized nations, and there's a reason for that. This is against a genital urinary tract of men and women. Oh, with men too? In trans yeah, men are transmitted exclusively, or almost exclusively via sex. This is one of the protozoan sexually transmitted diseases. Which goes back up to this one right here, right? Occurs in people with pre existing STDs. If you already have an STD, you tend to become more susceptible to, to trichomonas infection and, of course, multiple sex partners. All right, infections in women result from vaginosis, and the symptoms are going to be an odiferous discharge, odiferous, odiferous discharge, vaginal cervical lesions, abdominal pain, painful urination, and painful intercourse. In this case, ladies, we are the ones that have a problem here, but a lot of times men are what? Asymptomatic. Asymptomatic for it. Oh. And the present trouble though, I did vaginal urethral secretion is going to be diagnostic for it. Actually, the symptomology is usually pretty diagnostic for this as well. And infections to uh, natural metal not as well. Don't worry about the drugs. What do you mean by diagnostic? I don't. So how are they going to diagnose it? If a patient comes in, how are they going to diagnose it? Just from the from what they say their symptoms are. Yeah, from using, using they don't have to test for it, is what you they, mean. They can, and they can look for trophozoites, right? But the easier way is to. But a lot of times, trust me, for women especially, if they come in with this, the, the symptomology is really pretty diagnostic. Oh, okay, I see. All right, and these are kind of I think they're kind of cute looking little guys. <laughs> Alright. Okay. Thank you Which one Parasitive and protective form is characterized by chronic okay. This is him. Oh, yeah, let's go through all Complicated uh, complex of organelles at their integral end, don't worry about that. Parasitic animals, the life cycles involve at least two types of hosts. This is where you have Two different types, not just a definitive host. Cyogeny is a major feature of intercomplex in life cycles. So the multinucleated cytosol form before the cells divide. We're doing it step by step, and this is what I kind of want you guys to know. Uh -oh. Okay, and this is why. This is a plasmodium is the causative agent of malaria. But malaria and TB are still the two biggest what? What are they? Between malaria and tuberculosis, those are the two main what? 
Um, infectious killers in the world. If you put those two together, and they're, they, mm -hmm. but they're still one and two. All right. So four species cause most infection: Plasmodium falciparum, Plasmodium vivax, Plasmodium ovula, and Plasmodium malariae. Plasmodium thalwasi is an emerging human pathogen, and this is part of it. And malaria is endemic throughout the tropics and subtropics. Anopheles mosquito is the vector. Where do we have Anopheles mosquitoes in the U.S., or do we? Probably southwest, because it's warm. Florida. Florida, the south, and then you start moving up, okay? So we have some Anopheles here, too. But money life cycle has three prominent stages, and this is the one you're going to see where some of these things <coughs> can be incredibly complicated in their life cycle. But what would that give you as a clinician or as a researcher? What do you guys think? What do you mean, give us, like, problems? Could this give you an advantage if you've got this complicated life cycle? Oh, yeah, because you could stop it in different stages. You've got several different ways to put in target that. That's one of the advantages. <coughs> um, is it endemic in the U.S.? Has it ever been endemic in the U.S.? Have you ever heard of malaria in the U.S., anybody? Oh, no. Well, I mean, it Not kind anymore. of was back in, like, when they first, like, came over here. They, like, moved into, like, the streams in New England, and a lot of the Native Americans didn't go there because they knew that the water there was, um, it was still standing water. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it wasn't, I don't know if you would say endemic, but, like, there was definitely, like, a big place. It was actually most definitely endemic in the U.S. back in the day. They and Louisiana, it. right? Yeah. And they eradicated it by using DDT, and What's Which DDT? Has its own problems. <laughs> What's DDT don't. again? The uh, it's a it's a very potent insecticide. I'm already talking about it. It has a lot of effects on other organisms, especially birds. Well, my dad actually used to be a DDT sprayer down in Georgia. He still with us, so. All right. So now, what's the problem now? What are we worried about now? That's problem. What was that? That it's going to come back because of the mosquitoes? Not only is it going to come back, it has come back. There's a small area outside of Washington, D.C. and Virginia that is now endemic with malaria. What? Because it's moved back in. I'm telling you guys, suckers are on the move. I hope I'm okay, let's go to those in a minute. So here, that's the same slide, it's just bigger. Not endemic is going to be kind of this what? Not usually there. No. I mean, they still got it here, but they're saying now there's a small patch that's endemic in here. So if you have malaria and you're in the U.S., what, where did you probably catch it? In the south. If you have a patient come in and they got malaria, where did they get it? Probably somewhere in Africa. Somewhere, somewhere anywhere in the tropics, somewhere down there. So what happens? The closer you get to the equator, the what? The, the higher the numbers. Yeah, the more prevalent <coughs> it is. Okay. Africa the most, it has the highest prevalence. Then I would think Asia and it's up there. All right, so let's look at the life cycle. Female Anopheles mosquito injects sporozoites into the human during blood meal. The sporozoites travel through the bloodstream and invade the liver cells. So this is how the liver cells actually part of this infection. Okay? And undergo shyosity. Okay, shyosity. Generally two weeks later, the liver cells rupture and release about 30 to 40,000 mirozoites into the blood. The liver is damaged. So this one causes what? It's one of the clinical manifestations of this. You're going to be liver what? Failure or damage. Usually that. But, but what can you get if you get liver damage? Jaundice. You can put it in some jaundice and some scarring. One of the big ones, though, is going to be this stage right here. So the free, and that's the liver phase. Now we're looking at the erythrocytic phase. The free merozoites penetrate erythrocytes, okay? And the merozoites become trophozoites. Shown in, uh, so you, you actually, I'm oh, sure you have some slides. You can actually see these ring structures inside of red blood cells. Oh, and that's usually how they diagnose this a lot of times. Okay. So the trophozoites undergo shyosony again to produce mirozoites, which are released when the erythrocytes break open. This occurs, and this is what is interesting about this it occurs what? Simultaneously, somehow they get this clock going so they all release or burst from the red blood cells at the same time. What? Okay. How? So simultaneously in the, in the uh, cyclically every 48 to 72 hours that depends on the type of malaria it is. Okay? 
The damaged liver cannot effectively process the amount of hemoglobin released, and then you can't get jaundice. What else do you think you can get if you're damaging a bunch of red blood cells? Uh, anemia. Anemia is a big one. Now, some areas are like developed in males and females gametocytes within the erythrocyte, and this is where it gets pretty straightforward. Release males are like a key or two and then affect new erythrocytes, and you have what? More so what is the initial effective stage of malaria? What organ does it target? Liver. Liver. liver first. The liver, right? And then it goes to the red blood cells and you have this circular pattern, right? Crazy. The problem with this is every 48, 72 hours, all these red blood cells lice. That's nuts. What do you think that's going to do to the immune system? It's going to overwhelm it because they're all coming out at the same time. It's going to overwhelm, but you usually get this. That's when you go through these phases of, of active symptomology. Fever, chills, shakes, lethargy and stuff. It just kind of kicks you in all at once. Okay? So, now this is when they're going to be gametocytes. So the anopheles mosquito ingests erythrocyte containing gametocytes during a blood meal. The gametocytes leave the erythrocyte and turn into gametes and then fuse the form of zygote. So you've got fertilization outside of anywhere. It's actually inside of the mosquito, right? Mm. The zygote differentiate, and this is just where it turns into more of these little guys right here. Alright, well then we're not going to this outbreak then. Alright. Numerous virulence factors, the parasites hidden from the immune system went inside the erythrocytes. So until they escape all at once, is the immune system going to be able to detect it very easily? Mm. No. And what do erythrocytes have not have much of inside of them? Going back to 1306. No, no, I guess it's working in peace. Huh? They don't have any out, right? So they're going to produce a bunch of. MHC class molecules? Not even really, right? They don't have the organelles to, to process these things. So these things are really good at hiding inside of there. Malaria secretome releases toxins and enzymes into the host. And adhesions help the parasite avoid clearance in the spleen. So the red blood cells are going to get in there and they're just going to stay. All right? And the mirazoites avoid the uh, immune cells in the liver. So all in all, malaria has adapted to do what? Hide. What does it adapt to do? Mass produce. Mass produce and do what also? And it, and it just hides. I mean, it's really, to me, it's a malaria is amazing the way it works. It yeah. helps evolve. And this is why it's been hard to come up with a vaccine for it. It's hard for vaccines for parasites anyway. But in particular, malaria has been really hard. All right. Some species form dormant hypodolites. I think that's probably the worst one. And this is really right here. Now, not only are they taking over your body, making it into uh, malaria factories, do they want to stay in your body? No. So they actually induce biting chemical signals in humans to attract other mosquitoes that come to feed off. Some of these things that look like somebody made them in a lab sometimes. <laughs> All right, this is what's interesting to evolutionarily. Genetic traits increase malaria resistance in endemic areas. Hemoglobin C, deficiency in glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase, lack of Duffy antigens on erythrocytes. Problem is, some of these other ones also have what? Some of these genetic traits also have what? If you're deficient in glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase, what is that going to do? <coughs> Anybody? Well, glucose, probably some kind of diabetic. Oh, glucose 6 glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase. These are going to cause some of the energy, some of your ATP production issues and other things. ATP. What is sickle cell trait? Isn't that... That's sickle cell anemia, right? Oh. This is sickle cell trait, and this is what's interesting about this whole coevolution with malaria in humans. Sickle cell anemia can be fatal, right? Mm -hmm. Sickle cell trait is when you only have one copy of the sickle cell gene. The other copy is a good copy. So you don't have sickle cell anemia, you have sickle cell trait. 
But that actually gives you what? Protection against malaria. And if you're protected mm. against malaria, are you going to have greater fitness? Yes, so you're going to be able to produce more what? Offspring, but if you've got a lot of people with sickle cell trait, the chance of their offspring having anemia. sickle cell anemia goes up. So it's kind of this double-edged sword thing how they're floating around. And you can have a little issue with sickle cell trait too where you have slightly less oxygen carrying capacity because there was a football player who had it in the NFL and he couldn't play in Denver. Oh, the, the altitude. The altitude. He needed more blood. He needed more oxygen capacity. So he actually couldn't play anymore. All right. Symptoms of malaria are associated with the cycles of erythrocytic lysis. Okay, this is what's interesting. Include fever, chills, diarrhea, and headache. That's the acute things. Loss of lyrical signs are going to cause what? Anemia, which is going to lead to weakness and fatigue, right? But some of these things, some of these symptoms, these chills, the fever, and everything can be just almost catastrophic to the patient when they, with a particular with falciparum. It can kill, actually kill the patient sometimes. So there's having violent fevers and chills where they're shaking. It's pretty horrible. And that would, that's what can kill the patient? Right here. Falciparum, yeah, this one can. So falciparum causes serious disease, black, uh, black water fever. So death of brain tissue can be fatal within 24 hours. <laughs> So falciparin is the worst one. Okay. Immunity develops as the victim survives the acute stage. In the acute stage, it's going to be what? When they're first infected, right? I'm giving them All right. So what is the worst of the plasmodiums? <coughs> Falciparin. So diagnosed are based on the protozoan and blood smears. And again, you can actually see those little rings in the, in the erythrocyte. Antimalarial drugs can be chloroquine, arrhythmine, and artichoke. That's a new one they're getting from a plant. What else was in the original, the original traditional anti-malarial drug? <coughs> Anybody know? Control, everybody knows this. They put those mosquito nets, they put netting on the houses, right? Inhalation of standing water reduces mosquito breeding, use of insecticides and netting prevents bites. Individuals trying to make areas can take preventative medication. So usually if you're going to go somewhere where you know there's malaria and you're going to be there a short time, you take these drugs prophylactically. What was the first anti-malarial drug? It came from a plant too. What is a popular drink? From England, not tea. <laughs> An alcoholic beverage. Not Scots. That's actually from Scotland. <laughs> England, nope. No. Anybody? Gin. And what do you usually put? Well, usually, well, a lot of people put in gin. Tonic. You ever see tonic? What the other name for tonic water is? Mineral oil. Nope, not mineral water. Mineral water is more like seltzer water. It's called quinine water. Quinine water. The original drink, the original drink was the original treatment for malaria was quinine. It's a naturally occurring drug, <clears throat> and they used to put gin in it back in the day because it was so nasty. Because they had to put something in it to taste it. I think tonic water is nasty anyway. Um, but the tonic water now is, I think. One twentieth of the concentration of the quinine that used to be in it back then. So now it wouldn't do it again. But that's where you would see that's where you would actually see these people drinking gin and tonic when they were down in Africa when England was expanding about the time. Wow. And malaria is actually they're going back to quinine now because malaria is becoming resistant to a lot of these other drugs. Okay. <laughs> that is very crazy cool. All right. Also tonic water fluoresces on a black light. Toxoplasmosis, T. gondii, the cause of the toxoplasmosis. Somebody tell me what this one causes. Or how do you get this? Is this Cats. the one with the Cats. litter? Cats. Good. This the is litter. the one where if you're pregnant, they tell you not to clean what? Cat litter. Cat litter boxes. Good. One of the world's most widely distributed parasites. I think that I've <coughs> data in here. 
Wild domestic animals and birds are the major reservoir. Cats are the definitive host. Okay? An effects due to consumption of undercooked meat containing the parasite is the usual route. Oh. And ingestion and inhalation of contaminated soil can also occur. This is the one that usually is going to get to. Uh, Immunocompromised. Yes. Inhalation. All right, so look at the life cycle here. Let me do a forecast. Oh. So, sexual reproduction with birds that occurs in the cat's digestive system. That's why it's a definitive host, right? Yeah. That's where the adult reproductive stage is, right? Okay, and the immune host, immature host cysts are shed in cat species. Oocysts produces internal sporozoites, and erosion of bird ingests sporozoite oocysts, and you can just have this round and round right here. Or, livestock or humans consume them and then becoming accidental hosts. So you, your cow consumes, I don't know what a cow is supposed to be eating, it's supposed to be this, it's probably in the soil. No, it's probably, they poop on their food, though. No? Yeah, and they'll probably be something like that, they would ingest the spores. So, the cow eats the spores, the spores like invade the tissue, developing into bradyzoites and forming pseudocysts, then we eat the cow, and what? We get it. We get it. Is, it, is that less likely in the United States because of all the... Actually, I, want to say, I, don't, I didn't check on this to see if it had the actual amount. There's something like 90% of the world's population. It has been the places in France, I think 90% of the population, the population has been infected with toxoplasmosis. What? The U.S. is maybe like 80. I'll look, I'll look at those data on you. But anyway, this is just round and round. But the interesting part about this I want to talk about in a minute. Most infections are asymptomatic. Oh. That's why most of us have it and never even know. Okay? <laughs> Toxoplasmosis develops in the small number of people producing fever combined with other symptoms, but it's usually a self-limiting infection. Most people just think, I've got what? I've got a what? A bug. I've got a virus. I've got something going on. Okay? Toxoplasmosis is going to be more severe in two different patients. Obviously, HIV patients or AIDS. Actually, you've got you to you clarify now, don't you? Mm -hmm. There's a difference between an HIV patient and an AIDS patient. What is it? The advancementness of the disease. Well, what's the difference? Even better than that. Not the advancementness, but what's the even better definition? The total loss of the immune system. So, what's the difference? What is the what again? Because you really can't say them all. One, if you have HIV, if you have AIDS, you're immunocompromised. You have active disease. If you have <coughs> HIV, that just means what? It's it's still there, but it's inactive. You've just been infected, and more than likely you're on immunosuppression. No, you know, you're a virus, antiviral drug, right? And what about fetuses, though? <coughs> what do the doctors tell you, moms out there? What? About toxoplasmosis. Oh, not to change cat litter and stuff like that. Do they tell you why? They or tell they you. Just, they just say don't do that. Just cat don't litter. do that. Don't explode. <laughs> <laughs> why? Just don't. So, transposome transfer of the protozoan can cause abortion, stillbirths, or various birth defects. That's mm -hmm. why. <laughs> All right. So uh, are protozoans uh, prone to crossing that, that placental barrier? No, there's only a few that can. Toxoplasm is one that can. And this is what it looks like inside of this. It's going to be that pseudocyst. So there's going to be a bunch of the toxo toxoplastique on the eye inside of there. All right. So serology most common diagnostic method. Asymptomatic infections require no treatment, obviously, because it's self-limiting, right? Mm -hmm. Even if you get it. So symptomatic infections could be treated. Arrhythmia and don't again, don't worry about these. <coughs> could be meat and avoiding contaminated soil. But what have we said about the original thing it does to mice? Because now where they link toxoplasmosis to you. I don't know Schizophrenia, I you said that. Schizophrenia. Yeah, and it makes mice like not afraid. So, so it also gets rid of the fear response in mice. Yeah. So it makes it very easy for the cats to do what? Eat them. Yeah, when the mouse gets in there, what's up? <laughs> but what has that done evolutionarily? What has the parasite done? It's created a uh, healthy attack. A new host. It's created a nice way in the mice to keep that infection going round and round and round in cats. Or anything else. All right, cryptosporidium uh, parvum causes cryptosporidium uh, enteritis. I don't think how much I'm going to do it. What's not to take away livestock and poultry? Humans can carry the parasite asymptomatically as we go through this. Drinking contaminated water. That's, I'm going to skip over those. Like a lot of that's what these are, right? 
I want to get to the better part of the word. Causes severe diarrhea accompanied by headache, muscle pain, cramping, fluid, and weight loss. So this is a nasty diarrheal disease. Chronic disease is an indicator of HIV positive individuals who in heparin rest to what? Wow, AIDS. AIDS. So this was one of the indicator diseases for AIDS patients back in the day. And that's what they look like inside of you. So, uh, osis, we're not going to about that. Don't worry about that. Prevented by, now this is what I want you to look at right here. A lot of these cysts, including Giardia, but in particular crypto, are resistant to chlorination. Resistant to chlorination. Okay. So what does that mean? It's in our water. In the pool or in your what? Water. Drinking water. So prevented by filtration of drinking water, remove the osis. What could happen with this? <coughs> Good personal hygiene prevents fecal oral transmission. I think they can afford it that better. What do you think can happen with this? Why are they concerned about crypto? And that's what they thought. You guys would be over here to be clinically or anyone else that's going to call it crypto. This is what they're talking about. Cause disease, but how? What can happen? It can it can affect like the whole. Uh, it can, it could be it could affect the whole area like, uh, like yeah. how we're we're using our our water treatment plant more. Uh, yeah. No. Okay. <laughs> like our water treatment plant, like it can uh, it can affect our whole. Can do that. Is that what? This is actually another one of the biological warfare agents they worry about. Mm -hmm. They had an outbreak in Milwaukee in the municipal water supply. It got very turbid one time. It mixed all up, and you had a bunch of cryptospores in there, and a whole bunch of the city got sick. How does that make it effective? It doesn't kill you. But how does that make it effective biological warfare? Again? Because you can't fight when you got diarrhea. If you're sitting in the hospital pooping your brains out, are you going to be able to fight? No. No. And they were really worried it was one of the first, they really thought it was a bioterrorism attack at first. Oh. They thought somebody put the crypto in there because it was this huge, gigantic bloom of crypto. And then eventually it went away. And they have no idea why. And they have no idea why it started. They have speculations about three different theories. One is runoff from agriculture. One was a busted pipe from the sewage. But they have no idea. But the point is, the chlorination system in Milwaukee municipal water supply was Didn't not stop strong it. enough to prevent it. Oh, wow. Reverse osmosis? Hmm? What is reverse osmosis? I, I really hate that term. Uh, what is reverse osmosis? Osmosis is what? Water pressure. The movement of water across the what? Semipermeable membrane. So what is reverse osmosis? So it goes from low solute concentration to high high solute concentration. So what's reverse osmosis? From high to low. Yeah, but what else is it? It's a fancy name for this. Filtration. They just push the water and get through a filter and they put it go and they filter out everything under high pressure. That's not really all it is. It's just a fancy name. It's reverse osmosis. <laughs> All right, cyclospora, cyclospora causes an emerging disease, cyclosporosis. This is another waterborne infection that occur with just ingesting contaminated food or water. Okay, outbreaks linked to raspberries in Central and South America. Okay, environmental reservoir for this one is unknown. Okay, so this right here, it's got this little life cycle here. So the human eater drinks the oasis. <coughs> that exist in the gut, invade other intestinal cells on a gastrogeny and release more merozoites. Merozoites and more, oh, I don't know, let's say that can't be right. Merozoites emerge from the intestine um, and undergo gastrogeny, lice the host cell, and just run through here. Now, this isn't what I wanted to show you here. They don't have that there. This is another one they're worried about as being a what? Another biological. potential biological warfare agent or a bioterrorist weapon. Because it also is resistant to what? <coughs> Fluorination. All of these are. Oh, wow. This one's not that bad. I haven't heard that much about this one, maybe. All right. So here we go again. These are all the, what? Protozoans. So now let's get the helmets. These are macroscopic, multicellular eukaryotic worms. These are going to be the fun ones. Life cycles are very complex, and intermediate hosts are often needed to support larval stages. So you'll have a definitive host, 
an intermediate host, and then you're going to have the one that infects and go back around. Adult worms are either, what does this mean? Two or one? Something. What does that mean? Like, uh, like they can be male or female? Oh. Um. Mm -hmm. Right, so these can either reproduce sexually or asexually. All right, three groups, cestodes, trematodes, and nematodes. All right. Oh, tapeworms. This I wanted to get through. I wanted to get through tapeworms. So, cestodes, commonly called tapeworms, are flat segmented intestinal parasites. But right here, all tapeworms lack a digestive system. So what does that mean? <laughs> You got, to, you got to do all the work. They're just going to eat up, pick up, and what? Absorb nutrients that come out from the digestion. Okay? All possess the same job, general body plan. And this is what it looks like. So here's the uterus, here's the testes, and here's the ovaries, which means it has both male and female, female parts, right? So that means it can reproduce what? Asexually. On its own. So this is what's called a mature proglottid. That's this little section right here. Wow. Golex is the head. So every single section can reproduce? Wow. Pretty much. Yeah. Huh? A lot of tape work. So if you, it gets cut, it can just reproduce? Well, then what happens is it's growing. These fall off. Oh. After they become gravid proglottids with eggs, individual eggs are not visible. They're cuticle. Okay? So now these can reproduce. This is uh, the scolex, which is the head. Uh. So it comes up and it does well with the little hook. It wraps off with the hooks and then attaches with the sucker. What does it mean? Can you imagine that thing about this big? Take you around. All right. So, eggs to egg filled proglottids are passed into the environment to feces. <clears throat> animals or humans, okay? Then the intermediate host of Jesse eggs of the contaminated food like we were talking about. In this case, it's gonna be a pig, okay? The eggs hatch into larvae, then penetrate the intestinal wall and migrate to other tissues. So this is where this was complex. It doesn't stay in the gut, it's gonna leave the gut. So it doesn't go in the gut, reproduce, and then shed eggs out through the feces. What did it do? The larva develops into a cyst and it sits in the muscle. Humans then do what? Not just humans, but in this case we're talking about humans, right? Humans ingest the, the cystic psychosis in raw or undercooked contaminated meat. In this case, that meat would be? Pork. Bacon. Pork chops. Sausage. I'll probably have some of these. <laughs> cystic psychosis exists and attached to the mucus of the small intestine as the scolex, which is that little part that attaches, which matures, the adult worm forms new proglottids and the life cycle repeats. Now what's the problem with this in, t in case of a pork tapeworm? What do you mean? Um, it, it, it starts to eat all your nutrients, like you don't, you don't. Uh, that's the okay part. <laughs> the bad part is when, what does this thing do inside of, the, inside of this? It escapes the intestinal wall. And that's where you have problems with tapeworms when they leave the intestinal wall and they think they're in a pig and then they find out they're not in a pig <laughs> until so they go and insist somewhere in the muscle or the liver or the brain. Mm. So tinea, tinea segmata <coughs> is a beef tapeworm. If you're going to get a tapeworm, this is the one you want. This was actually in what back in the 60s, 50s, and 60s? It might help. It's a bad <laughs> It was in diet pill. They would put the little you lie. Eggs in the, huh? You're lying. They would put the little proglottid eggs in the in the. Uh, do you remember that? Uh, yeah. Wait, what? Yeah, I think it's on. Yeah, it was like. Yeah, yeah, it might it was be. Like, yeah. Super like illegal. You have to go to like Mexico or something. What? Yeah, that's what you have with the, locally with Mexico. Yeah. Yeah, the U.S. kind of frowns on <laughs> selling parasitic worms to people. All right. Genesolinium, this is the pork tapeworm, this is the one that's bad. Calum swine serve as the intermediate host. Humans living close to livestock or with inadequate sewage treatment has a highest incidence of infection. 
Adults attached to intestinal epithelium. Most individuals shed without having any symptoms. Strobilia. So you just come out and if you wanted to, uh, I'll talk about diagnostics in a minute. Which one's the strobilia? It's a different strain? That's going to be the, the little problem thing when they start coming off. Oh. Intestinal blockage can occur if the tapeworm is too large. <laughs> How long can these things get? Feet. How many? Feet? Yeah, like Couple feet? Like, I've seen five. Like they found one and one will grow like 25 feet long. Oh. <laughs> Diagnosis based on the identification of the proglottis and fecal samples. So they're going to take a fecal sample and you look at microscopically and see the little proglottis coming out. Can you but like you can feel them when they're that big? <clears throat> there was the only one little girl that, that she, whenever she would eat, she would get some weird sensation in her throat. In her throat? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Although I kind of think about, I would kind of question that. It's a good story, but yeah. but they need the digestive yeah. food. So why would they be coming up looking for the food? I, mean, I love the story. Unless it's the tail part, like they're trying to eat. Oh, maybe it's so long. Could be, could turn around. Yeah. Man, but they usually could. Uh. I just like it. It's a good story. <laughs> I'm a little skeptical. All right, to make your life a product of you know freezing meat. So if you freeze meat really well, it's pretty good. So, this is a piece of meat, Ugh. and this has what? This has stones in it, okay? I cannot handle this. This is gross. Yeah, but we'll have lunch later. All right. Now, I want to talk about this a minute. <laughs> One thing that I've learned, I've heard, I'm not true, actually, I know it's true, <laughs> is that there are some places in Central and South America where this type of meat is a delicacy. Yeah. You actually Central get... America. Huh? Central America? Central America, South America, I don't know about Mexico, but it's supposedly a delicacy. So ideally, the little cyst is supposed to help tenderize the meat up and everything in there. And you can actually buy it. And you just got to make sure you do well with it. Cook it. Cook it. You don't want to eat this rare. That's for sure. Mm, that's so gross. Yeah, once you cook it. Now, how about, how about pork tapeworms in the U.S.? Because we're almost done here. We're finishing Can you, up like, Friday. Change the picture. <laughs> is there a problem in the U.S.? <laughs> no. I thought I'd talk about this beginning of the semester because this is uh, a problem. Is it a problem in the U.S.? Um, it shouldn't be. They have said that all U.S. pork producers are free of trichinosis and pork tapeworms. So ideally, you can eat raw pork now if you want in the U.S. It sounds gross. Maybe it's going to be raw pork. However, this is a problem I have with the, and it's an international, this is an international issue. A bunch of countries sued the U.S. and the international courts because the U.S. was making all meat producers put the country of origin on their meat. Oh, yeah. And they said this is giving the U.S. producers an unfair advantage. So they changed the rule now, and now I understand that you cannot put the country of origin on your meat. So, what does that do to pork? Even though we are tapeworm free in the U.S., if you buy pork in, I don't know, like buy World Market or something, oh. anywhere, do you know where that came from? No. Well, it's not. Well, so I go back to cooking your pork. So <laughs> people go get groceries and sweaters. So right. when you come mm -hmm. over, like that's why they stop you from bringing up any sorts of meat. Right, and that's why because of the, mainly because of these two right here, the tapeworm. Yeah. All right, guys. I'll see you in lunch. Lab. Okay.